Hello, my name is Stephen Thomas, and I'm speaking on the day of the burial of Nelson Mandela, a man who exemplified many biblical traits, among them obedience, simply letting things go, and forgiveness. Whether he knew it himself or not, he, and I think he did, because he was a fairly moral man, he exemplified letting things go. And that is what the Bible often just talks about. Just obey. Let things go. Forgive your enemies. And uh, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath, etc. But so many of us just struggle to handle that simple statement. Anyway, the sermon at the very end was given by a Bishop Siwa. And he spoke about the parable of the talents. But he came to a remarkable conclusion on this parable. I've never heard his conclusion before. And I want you to ask yourself, was his conclusion his own conclusion? Or is it actually what the parable was meant to bring about? Now look, a parable is short for comparable. It is comparing something with something. And... It is always a little short story meant to make one point and one point generally only. And if you start getting multiple points out of this or turning it into a, a political um, ideology, then I'm afraid you're going to be completely mistaken. But anyway, let's just see uh, this parable. Now, also, the parables generally interpret themselves. They don't need you to put your own spin on it, because they, the, the, the parable is normally explained in the context. Anyway, what makes it quite interesting is he chose from Matthew, to read this parable of the talents, from Matthew 25, verse 13. And I'm going to just read it uh, rather quickly. It's a story about a man who travels into a far country, he calls his servants, and he gives them his goods, and he gives to the first one five talents, and to the other two, and to another servant he gives them one, according to their various abilities. So, he, and then he says, occupy till I come, and he takes on his journey. And then the man who received the five and the two talents, they trade with it, and they make double their money for, uh, for their master, and when he returns, they give it, the money over to him. But the one who receives one talent, and apparently in this uh, Matthew 25, he was the man with least ability, he went and hid his talent in the ground, and when his master returned, he dug it back up and he said, here is your one talent that you gave to me. Now, very interestingly, the same story parable is told in Luke 19 verse 12, but there are a few slight differences when Luke tells it. In Matthew, it's just a man. In Luke, it's a nobleman. But obviously in Matthew, this is a man of influence because he's got a talents, which is not uh, singing or dancing ability. It is a amount of money. In both of them, it is an amount of money which is given. In this case, it's a nobleman. He go, both go into a far country. In Luke, the parable is the nobleman's going to receive a, a kingdom. It doesn't explain the reason why he goes into a far country in uh, Matthew. And he calls his ten servants in the case of Luke, whereas it doesn't specify in, in Matthew how many servants there were. But in both of the parables, in both of the explanations, three cases are mentioned. There's the great, the average, and then there's let's say, the useless servant. So, there are still three categories of people, but in Matthew, he gives five talents to the one. Let me sit here. He gives five talents to the one, two to the other, and one to the least talented person. And in Luke's uh, telling of this parable, one pound is given to each of the servants. Then, um... In Matthew, the servants, the two servants double there. So the one that had five makes an extra five. The one that, that has two makes an extra two. In this case, when he returns, the one who each received one pound, but the one gets ten pounds back. 
So he's got a tenfold profit, whereas that only double bears there. And then the other guy made a fivefold profit, so he returns five pounds. But now we come to what is called the um, sort of the idle servant in both parables is the person who goes and buries his. Now in in Matthew 25, he buries his in the ground, whereas in Luke 19, the guy wraps it in a napkin. Well, maybe he wrapped it in a napkin before he buried it into the ground. But in both cases, this man reasons that his master is a hard man. In Luke, he calls him an austere man. Both mean very similar things. That this is a master who is to be feared, and he's a master who's going to want his pound of flesh. That's the attitude that the servant has. And if he wants his pound of flesh, boy, I don't want to lose that pound, that talent, so I'm going to just go, bury it. When he comes back, I'll give him his pound, and that should make him happy. But it doesn't make the master happy at all. First of all, the master is very unhappy with his attitude. So, let's just read... Um, what happens when the man returns in both cases. So, in the first case, the Lord is praiseworthy of the servants who have doubled the amount here, and he, and, but he doesn't specify the reward. He just says to them, um, he says, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So he doesn't specify what he's going to rule over. He just says, I'll make you Lord of many things. Whereas in Luke, he says, that you've been faithful in a very little, have you authority over ten cities? So the reward is stated as you will rule ten cities because I'm the noble man and I will give you ten cities to rule. So you can see that clearly this is the same parable. But here is my point, as I said. Each parable has making, is making the same point. You might not recognize this at the moment, but both parables are making the same point. Point, and it's only one point they really are making. Let's, let's carry on with this. So, let's get to the wicked man. Now, this is what he, the wicked, this is what he's said about the wicked. And, he, where, and when he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not stored. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the earth. Lo, there you have that is yours. His Lord answered and said unto him, You wicked and slothful servant. So he calls this man a wicked and slothful servant. Now, Bishop Siwa said, I identify with this wicked and slothful servant. He was fighting injustice. He was fighting the fact that um, the underprivileged, the person who has less ability, this talent is anyway going to be taken from him and given to the person with ten talents. And here he's fighting an unjust cause against a master who's oppressive. And he gets punished, we shall see, for his attitude. He's prepared to make sacrifices for the struggle like Nelson Mandela. I think Nelson Mandela would be turning if he heard this parable being interpreted this way. But let's read on. You ought therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. So, he, so the master says, you should have given mine to the bank and I would have at least got interest. But we're not supposed to take this parable as endorsing, let's get interest from the bank. That's not the point of the parable. If you get distracted by that, you're going to be mistaken. And it says, therefore take the talent from him and give it to the, him that has ten talents. Doesn't that sound unfair? But doesn't a ruler or nobleman or king do what exactly he likes? And isn't that the whole point of the story that Christ, the ruler of the universe, does exactly what he likes? And who are you to come with a bad attitude and say, my master, my ruler, how can you expect to get something for nothing from me? You expect me to work for you and with the sweat of my brow give you everything that I have worked for and it's just so unfair. And it just seems that you are reaping where you have not sowed. I was the one who did the work. This mine, the gold that was mined in our country, it was mined by us. The houses, they were built by us. This is ours. We have built it. It's not yours. You, you're being unfair to even demand this of us. 
But anyway, so that's the attitude that many workers, especially here in South Africa, have, and I'm sure around the world, that they don't expect their boss or their master to have a reward from their labors. Do you think that your boss employs you for your good looks? Hey, sweet cheeks, we just want you to stand around and look pretty, or does he actually hire you to make a profit? Yes. But we think it's so unreasonable that the boss wants us to behave in a way that is profitable to him. It's not unfair. We want to get employed and then sit there, idle, do nothing, and be paid. That seems to be the attitude. We don't want to be working, and we think it's unfair that we make a profit. We want the profit. We don't think that our boss or our company or our employees should, uh, employer should get the profit. But anyway, take therefore the talent from him and give it to him that is ten talents for unto every one that has shall be given and he shall have abundance but from him that has not, meaning has not made a profit, shall be taken away even that which he has and cast you the unprofitable servant. So this is the whole point of the parable explained to us. If you're an unprofitable servant, how can you expect a reward from God? And so it says, And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, in the case of Luke, he's not cast into uh, outer darkness. This is what he says. Uh, this is what happens to the servant. For I say unto you, that unto everyone that has shall be given, and from him that has not, even that he hath shall be taken away. You see how Luke, um, in verse uh, 26, says exactly the same as he said in Matthew 25, But those my enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring here, and slay them before me. So instead of casting them into outer darkness in Luke 25, they are slain before the ruler, the nobleman. And if you see that both, uh, both parables have exactly the same point, and the point is that the person with the attitude, that unprofitable servant, had the attitude of, who are you to tell me what to do? Why should you reign over me? I'm not getting the benefit of everything that I'm working for. I don't see why you, the employer, should get any benefit at all, the master. I want the benefit because I do the work. But that's not the way it works. And so in Luke, the, he's, the unprofitable servant is criticized for having the attitude of, why should you, the boss, rule over me? Whereas... In Matthew 25, he's simply called an unprofitable servant. So what makes the servant unprofitable is his attitude towards his employer, his boss, his master, that why should I do what you want me to do? And what the boss wanted him to do was make profit for the company. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. And he had a terrible attitude towards the master. And that is, you're a hard person, you're unreasonable, you're unjust, I'm not going to... Do anything but the very minimum I'm going to just bury my talent, wait for you to return out of sight. I won't do a thing while you're not watching me. And so he gets into serious trouble. But I hope that you see that both parables have got exactly the same point. That to be a profitable servant of God, one has to make a profit for God. One has to produce fruit for God. One has to in other words, be ruled over and not come to your own conclusion of how I want to be God's servant or the master's servant. Oh, you can't be it in your own way. You must do what he says and be profitable. And if he says go out and make money for the master, that's what you must do. And that's in fact not the point of the parable. God is not saying go and make money for God. He's just illustrating one point, and that is God expects his servants to be profitable and to have a good attitude of being prepared to be ruled over.